Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks, Season 2, Episode 8, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. Um, so, as ever, guys, please leave a like, leave a comment on any of the things we've discussed today, and uh, as ever, please subscribe. Um, today's podcast, we're going to be discussing everything to do with industry, and then we thought we'd have, um, well, continue on our theme of horror month, being October, and talk about one of the most critically acclaimed horror directors ever in Wes Craven. So, without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. Quibby. Quibi is no more. <laughs> Quibi is shutting down. Now, if you've been keeping up with the podcast, you know we've talked about Quibi since it existed. We and were it there is at gone. the beginning, <laughs> and think we it's... said it was bad. We <coughs> yeah. said it would not work. I think every time we spoke Call about it. Quibi, I turn around and say, what's Quibi? <laughs> That's <laughs> how relevant it was. <laughs> For those who don't remember, Quibi is the format that Jeff Kat- Katzenberg had created, which is like a VOD site for your phone with seven-minute content that nobody cared about. There was literally maybe one show that got any sort of critical acclaim. Otherwise, no one cared from the start. The material just wasn't worth it. No one cared for Quibi. And Katzenberg, he's blaming COVID. Uh, I I mean, if anything, COVID was going to help him. When we heard about the pandemic, we were like, oh, this might be good for Quibi, actually. Uh, and, And they managed to not do anything on it (laughs) it was a stupid idea it restricted the creativity it was feeding it for money feeding the story and you had to pay for it basically bad idea just give the original material as it were Scarlett Johansson and Sebastian Lalo are doing a film which sounds really cool it's um it's back to her doing more indie films it sounds closer towards under the skin which you know Scarlett Johansson is a great actress this you know she's famous so she gets sucked up by Disney it's kind of a spin on Bride of Frankenstein and the Truman Show so it's about this scientist like mad evil scientist who's created the perfect woman and essentially she works out what she's made for and escapes into reality which is a great idea A24 and Apple are producing this and yeah it sounds like it could be just something different from what she's been stuck doing for a long time so yeah I'm curious by that film (laughs) I That's cats for you. <laughs> Stop it. I can see it coming a mile off. <laughs> oh. That's cats for you. So from cats to bats, the uh, Snyder Cut, <laughs> the Justice League one. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, was Jared Leto yeah. has been re-added to it. So you know his absolutely awful Joker character that he was so upset that he didn't get to have his spin-off film. And a lot of his material was cut out. He's now in this film. I don't know why. I guess they need to have a Joker in a Batman film. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. The film's already, as I've said before, costing an extra 70 million, which doesn't sound too much like an alternative cut as a complete reshoot. I'm completely <laughs> confused with the, the DC universe right now. Because there's the Batman. There's also Michael Keaton returning as Batman. There's... Ben Affleck's Batman, well, who was part of the Batman vs. Superman, which Jared Leto wasn't in, and Jared Leto was in Suicide Squad, which none of the characters from Suicide... It's like, well, I, are they just picking stuff at random? Oh, that'll work, and oh, yeah, we'll do that. It just I sounds think, really incoherent. If you think of it this way, Batman was in Suicide Squad. He appears in it. Well, yeah, so there's true. your tie-in. Done. <laughs> when it comes it's to so the, relevant that I don't even remember that. From what they're saying, because the Flash goes into production soon, and the Flash is a way of restarting everything <laughs> by having them go into the parallel universes, which then allows Michael Keaton to be in it and allows that Batman. So they're trying to reinvent it because the DC is in a good place because Joker made a lot of money and won lots of awards. So they're trying to be like, ah, that that world still exists. We'll find the right ending of what should have happened there, rather than just abandoning it. Probably mostly because there's a lot of talent involved in those films. They don't want to piss off. Yeah. Speaking of talent in those films, uh, the producers, John Berg and Jeff John, have been removed from the Justice League Snyder's Cut. Now, these two particular people apparently were quite not a fan of Snyder's vision. And when they brought Josh Whedon on, a actor, Ray Fisher, who played Cyborg, uh, lodged a complaint of um, harassment, it's never been directly said of what, but he was apparently they were very, very rude and very just like unprofessional in regards to what Snyder had invented. So it kind of makes sense they've removed their names from that. 
our favorite festival, Horror on Sea, has uh, decided that it will not be on in January. It is moving to May. It's moving to May the 14th to the 16th weekend and then 21st to 23rd weekend, which is obviously the much better idea. And it's great that they've decided to do this early before they've announced their lineup. It gives an opportunity for people to have that awareness. Plus, the uh, schedule will be released in January, which gives a lot of time to, you know, save up and be ready for an amazing weekend. We, uh, we will definitely be there. Whether we have a film in, we don't know, but we will definitely be there. That's uh, birthday weekend. Gonna be a good for one. You. Yeah. We love Horror on Sea. How old are you going to be, Sam? I'm going to be 32. <laughs> but yeah, we love Horror on Sea, so it's great to know that they're, they're not planning to... Although I love the virtual festivals, I'm happy that we actually get to go. Potentially. I mean, we, we'll, see, we'll still go see on things, but, you know, fingers crossed. And on Tuesday, we are going to be doing our very first ever Halloween horror quiz. Um, will it be good? We'll find out. I've never done anything like this. It's going to be very different. Um, but, but, you know, it's Halloween. Just wanted to have a bit of fun with everything being so different. Why not? And we've got some great guests, uh, our contestants. We have uh, Neil Jones from Without Your Head. We have Ashley Turner from Grill Girls Productions. We have Annabella Rich, who was uh, recently in our film Acting. And um, we've also got Sing Lao from Horror on Sea. So hopefully you can join us from 8 p.m. on the YouTube channel. I'll be hosting. Ryan will be my sidekick. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some fun. You can join in, but, uh, but it is all for free. There is no prize or anything. It's just a bit of fun. Um, yeah, join us then. I'm your Robin to your Batman. I was thinking more like you were like <laughs> Igor if I was Frankenstein. That's, that's, that's a bit harsh. Well, it's Halloween. <laughs> that's mixing two, two things together. Is no, no, no Igor Ego and Frankenstein are together. I can be Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. And you can be Frankenstein. Who's Dracula's guy? I always thought that was Igor for some reason. It's Renfield. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> so on that side note... <laughs> So, guys, continuing on the theme of the month, horror, with it being October and stuff, celebrating Halloween, we decided we want to talk about Wes Craven. And I kind of, I wanted to start this by kind of speaking about his first film, which was The Last House on the Left. Mm. I think it was 1972 that came out. And one of the fascinating things that I find really interesting about that, when I was doing a bit of research into this, is that when he made that film, it was actually... It bombed, didn't it? It wasn't well received. And um, Wes Craven actually then decided to start writing other stuff, but he couldn't get any financial backing for it. Until then, he did The Hills Have Eyes, and that then fully fledged, well, made him a fully fledged horror film director. And he's quoted as saying that he just knew that he was going to do horror the rest of his career. The thing with the, 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 the House on the Left is that it's a very, it's a reactionist film. Mm. Like he made that film because of the anger he was feeling towards Vietnam. This was the early 70s. America was fucked. It was a horrible place. Nixon running around everywhere and depression. The hippie movement was over. It was Nixon just not running a, around <laughs> everywhere. You, you get what I'm saying? Like his, his hand is his control. Like Trump's doing right now. But during that particular time, he wanted to do something that was, yeah, a reaction to that, to show the violence and to show how because obviously the soldiers we learned that the soldiers have caused a lot of violence towards the citizens of Vietnam in an almost massacre sense with the My Lai massacre and, and things like that and I think he just wanted to do something that was that vivid in fact like we we, um, we recently saw doing a bit of research on it we saw that he himself said that one of the reasons why it's quite like jump cutty and sort of rough around the edges is he wanted it to give a very documentary feel to it so the violence felt as real as the Vietnam footage they were watching on the news which I think is like it works it's a very very disgusting disturbing film it's brilliant but it's a horrible film to watch especially when it goes in towards the second half where it becomes this weird violent home alone <laughs> scenario which again Wes Craven always seems to come to this home alone scenario way before home alone of course but Freddie she gets all ready she starts putting the wire on the stairs she gets all ready for him to come along they like, he likes that idea of being prepared for the thing you're about to face. Well, that takes us on to the Hills of Eyes. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't seen the original, but I remember watching the remake. And just the whole concept is obviously the same, mm. isn't it? The, the kind of people get lost out in the desert. And it, it, it's interesting because one of the major factors for him getting back into writing the Hills of Eyes is 
the Nevada desert was you were allowed to film in it ah, and okay. that was one of the main motivations for him to actually come up and make that concept I think um, it's one of those things that he always seems to do as well there's always a basis for where his monster is in his stories so the monsters in the hills of eyes the family that is based on an old like whether it's true or not you call it folklore of the west that there was a family that lived in the mountains who did eat people and it was also based on the the whole scottish thing where again the similar scenario of cannibals where these people found these scottish cannibals so he always bases it in some reality he does the same thing with freddie mm. freddie is very much his own sort of fear of a bully when he was younger as well as nosferatu and as well as the tibetan idea of um bringing things into existence so there's a whole lot of plays. It must always... have been something inspired by um, sleep paralysis as well, shortly. It feels like it, because there was part of that Tibetan experiment of where they all had a sleep terror collectively. So I think he just must have looked into so many levels. And that's the one thing I've always appreciated Wes Craven. He's a very intelligent filmmaker. He doesn't just... If he's going to do a horror, he's going to dissect why he's going to do that horror. Sometimes very literal, like in New Nightmare and, of course, Scream. But when he's like getting into that deeper area you have a much more vivid, nasty kind of creation. For me personally, his greatest creation, Freddy. I'm always going to go on about how great Freddy is. But there's something else that I was thinking about with, with Wes Craven. His, um, you know, his victims, or his final girls. He's created two of the greatest final girls there ever have been. Neve Campbell with Sydney. Yeah, Prescott. And then you've got Nancy from uh, Freddy Krueger. Two amazing final girls that you truly do feel, and I know you swear a lot, but you do feel the empathy to it. I think Wes Craven's very clever with that. We're giving you, they're never like a 2D um, protagonist. There's always enough of a, you feel everything they're going through. I think it, like, it's easy to fall into that trap when you're making a, uh, a, a protagonist or a final girl as well, because they have to be the sort of purest um, purest character so that you can uh, like all the other characters can be sort of assholes around them and they have to do nothing in order to be likeable yeah um, but to make them likeable of their own accord and uh, you know give them that that 3d kind of aspect to their character um, is quite difficult to do to get everyone to relate to them because you know you're making specifics I think that that works really really well in screen mm. because <clears throat> Sydney Prescott's character is not this like vulnerable she is vulnerable don't get me wrong but not the stereotypical kind of vulnerable woman in distress like really scared like she really goats ghost face mm. and she like calls him out several times and you see that especially in like screen two she's just kind of over it now and it's like right you you want to show your face like go on then do it and I think stereotypically with horror whenever you have a final girl they're never really like that they're the damsel in distress they they're they kind of running away and they get um they get out of it because of some sort of third party it's never really of their own kind of actions I suppose well then yeah going back to Nancy from um Nightmare on Elm Street she's exactly the same she's always like screaming back at Freddy and of course the big thing at the end of Nightmare on Elm Street is she faces him and says I'm not scared of you anymore you mm. can't do anything to me and that like really resonated for a lot of people. That's why a lot of people who felt bullied, that particular bit which she delivered made them feel like there was a hero and they could get out of that situation. And I think that's what he does so well with his final girls. It makes you go, yeah, these fuck, they can get out of this. They will be safe with this. They might be tortured several other times, but they will get out of this situation. So I think after A Nightmare on Elm Street, there was a phase where... I suppose Wes Craven was doing a lot of different films, but they weren't as successful. And that brought him back to then doing, was it Nightmare on Elm Street after that? Actually, before Nightmare on Elm Street, um, you've got a brilliant film. That, that This is the thing with Wes Craven. He's done a lot of films, and yeah, a lot of them aren't very good, but there are some that are just forgotten. And there's two films. There's um, Serpent in the Rainbow, which is a great like voodoo film. Um, and then there's People Under the Stairs. And The People Under the Stairs yeah, is an amazing I film. film. Yeah, it is a film that people forget because it's, it's borderline comedy. It's got a slight child angle because it's a little bit more innocent. But really, the, the things he's talking about are quite heavy. You've got this collection of um, two adults and the kids. And the adults want to rob the house of this very strange, borderline, like, white supremacist sort of couple. who are actually played by the two weirdos in Twin Peaks, which is really strange. And one of them's like dresses a gimp and... They try to rob the house and it all goes horribly wrong and they find out that they've been keeping people under the stairs. 
And it's more about like the direct fear and the direct evil is the people. It's not that you think it's going to be, oh, it must be the people on the stairs. That's why the title's leading to you there. But if anything, these are just people who have been taken and they're completely lost and then they try to like, they all kind of come together to get rid of them at the end. It's, it's, it's got quite a nice message to it. It is a film that gets lost, but it showed that he started to think about horror and like class and to think about things a little bit further. And yeah, that led to New Nightmare. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, it's like, again, it's him deconstructing things. He loves to take the horror genre and deconstruct it. But to go to your own franchise, which, you know, by that point, Freddy had turned into a bit of a joke. Yeah. And he brought back that kind of fear element with Freddy. Oh yeah, he was terrifying in in New Nightmare far more so than he'd, he'd been in like previous like the previous films, you know, previous few films before that. Um, and I, I that film, I, I it's my it's my favourite Freddy film, I think, um, just because it, of the way that it breaks down the films that he's done previously and the way that it sort of. Uh, I don't know, reintroduces these characters in a totally different mm. way where you're seeing the actor playing themselves as, yeah, and yeah. then playing the character on top of that and that sort of blend of reality and, and the idea that, you know, when you're when you're performing these things, you're kind of taking them on in some ways and, and that's the same kind of idea of Freddy in the first place is that if you believe it, it, it will sort of cut, it yeah, can, yeah. Uh, get to you, essentially. It sort of brought a, an air of realism to the character of Freddy and broke the fourth wall because it's almost like, oh, hold on, I'm watching someone that's in our reality that are talking about a film that they acted in and it's like, whoa, that's... that's I, I find it was really immersive in that sense I think it yeah it's, it's the very story within it as well is that Wes Craven he's in it mm, and he's yeah. writing this screenplay to bring Freddy back in because he thinks Freddy's become into our reality and of course it flips it and says that Freddy is this demon that's always existed but it became the form of Freddy because of these yeah, it became, it became it existed through the fandom and the films being there yeah. and related to to her is it's quite like it's really convoluted story it's mm. very complex and then the end of the film is the end of the script on the yeah on the thing. yeah yeah and that's that's quite mad as well is she not reading it is it nancy the character of nancy yeah, she's yeah, reading yeah. the actual end bit of the script mm. but what it does really nicely is um it brings in the one side that you don't get with the freddy films because the freddy films are about the kids of the parents who did the wrong and a big thing within new nightmare is the fact that she's a mother and she's trying to stop her child from being exposed to that sort of thing. And at the same time, Freddie's trying to get to the child. So it adds that element that you rarely see in the film where it is more about, it's not the parent who's in the wrong here. Mm. She's actually trying to save the child. It's kind of from the parent's the same, perspective. Yeah. At the same time, I think it, 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 you know, that film works on like questioning the, the morality of making those kind of horror films in the first place. Because mm. to a certain extent, how many children did have dreams and nightmares about Freddy coming oh, to Oh, I them? did. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's... Still do. That, so I in didn't. Some it was witches for me. <laughs> that's, that's very consistent. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I... I to me, like that's it is something that that people seem to, uh, you know, as horror filmmakers get older, they look back on what they've done yeah, in their yeah. past and kind of go, oh, was that good or bad? I mean, I made some good points in it, but you know, was it uh, something that was too scary for yeah. the for the world? Was it something that affected people in a negative way or a positive way? But I, I would argue that if 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 I was a director and I was making a horror film and I had a, a like a really iconic character that scared people, then I've done my job, haven't I? Well, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> and, and like, no, you know, but I think it's the water down that... effects. Like, I remember mm. seeing that Wes Craven, the moment he realized that Freddy was like kind of fucked, and that's why he actually co wrote the third script, was in the second film where he was in reality. There's a beach party scene, and for some reason, Freddy's in reality. And he was like, why is Freddy in reality? And that's the thing, I think he just wanted to get his hands back on it and reconstruct and almost like, um, oh, what's the word? It's reassessing it. It's reevaluating his own franchise. Revisionist. It's almost like a revisionist horror in that regard. Yeah. Which then, of course, led brilliantly to him working with um, Kevin Nicholson with Scream. Because so we have to remember, he didn't write I was going to talk movies. about Vampire in Brooklyn. I mean, I mean, <laughs> well, you can talk about that if you really want. <laughs> Good old Eddie Murphy. 
No, if you want to talk about Scream, go for it. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. I just, well, all I was going to say really is that I thought it was really interesting how he, he did like a revisionist horror film in the form of New Nightmare. And then the following year, he did like the sort of dark comedy um, horror film of Vampire in Brooklyn. It was just a complete flip. And that was kind of the first time in probably, I don't know, a good number of years that he'd done something that wasn't just horror. I suppose it helped for Scream in that regards because obviously Scream isn't a comedy, but it's funny, it's snappy, and it's it's one of the it is a perfect script. It's such a good script, and it was given to the perfect director who was already trying to like reassess what horror has become, especially when it came to franchise horror and of course with the slasher genre. Freddy is a slasher film after all, supernatural slasher, and of course Scream completely dissects all of it to the point. Well, you've obviously got characters within just talking about horror films constantly. Constant horror references just thrown in constantly. And they're not all Wes Craven's films, there are other films. And of course there's actors in it who are actually in horror films. You've got The Exorcist with Linda Blair's in it. Um, the amount of references to horror films in that, it's almost like a homage to horror. Well, Wes Craven himself is in Scream, dressed as Freddy as the janitor, and he goes, sorry, Freddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so, like, over the top with it that it's perfect, because it had to be done... You have spoofs of horrors, and you have satires of horrors, but something that deeply that understood the genre and understood what it'd become from, like, the viewers watching him. Mm -hmm. It's just so clever. I feel like that theme continues throughout the Scream franchise. Yeah. And even with the new one, if rumours are to be true, they're kind of going to do like a new nightmare version of it. But mm. before, yeah, we go on to that. Like Scream 2 for me, I thought was absolutely brilliant that they're effectively, like within the film, there's a film called Stab yeah, that yeah. is actually telling the story of the Drew Barrymore character that got killed at the start of Scream and it's like this film within a film like and it just plays on it and I think that's brilliant I honestly think though with the, with the sequels in particular I mean Scream 2 is good Scream 3 is not good but it's still good and Scream 4 is it's alright but they wouldn't be good if Wes Craven wasn't behind them yeah and it's so rare to see a director stick to his films like he didn't do it with the Freddy films he hasn't done it with the Hills Have Eyes films and well, he did it with the first two, the originals, and he's credited as a writer on the remix, but he's not actually, like, he's not involved. With the Hills as such. Eyes. The, With the remix, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, but do you think that's maybe why he was, uh, you know, uh, going to be damn certain that he was involved with every, every Scream film from then on? Like, you know, because, uh, I mean, he saw what happened to uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, um, potentially. You know, uh, I, 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 if I was watching that, I would be like, no, I'm never, I'm never letting those still bastards credited. get hold of this again. He's still credited as a writer on all of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. It's just oh, he? he didn't direct um, he, he the had, sequels until New Nightmare. Yeah, he, he co-wrote the second, the, the third film, sorry. But it's always like based on the original character mm. by Wes Craven. Um, when it comes to the Scream films, like... I always feel, because it's Dimension Films, yeah, and that's Bob Weinstein and Harvey Weinstein's company. It was a genre pick as part of um, Miramax. Yeah. And I feel like Wes Craven had one or two options. He's never really been a, a massive box office outside of horror and outside of particular franchises. So Nightmare on was successful, sure, and the Scream films were successful, but he's made a lot of horror films that were not successful. Mm. And I almost feel he kind of just kept with it because he knew it was a guarantee. He knew, he knew the world well enough, you know? Like, because there's so much control when you watch all the direction when the camera's like swooping around on every bit of the chase where Ghostface is trying to get any victim. They're so well choreographed. And I kind of feel like it was almost like the easy plane whenever they were like, eh, let's go for another Scream film. And he's like, all right, let's do it. Joe, sure, I, I love the way in Scream as well, they, they kind of... They changed that dynamic of the all powerful sort of evil person, killer, whatever, slasher. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghostface, you almost feel sorry for him. The amount of crap that he gets thrown at him. And <laughs> well, at one stage, like in the garage, I think I think it's in the first one, the woman um, just opens the fridge door and he just gets fucking taken out. And you're like, oh, give the guy a chance. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, 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 that, yeah. That's it. It's actually darker though, isn't it? By the, they give the guy a voice. They make him very human. He falls around. He falls over a lot. And then by the end of the film, especially with First Scream, when they reveal why they're doing it and there's no real direct motive, it's more terrifying. 
it's kind of chilling because it's humans. It's almost like what everyone would have thought a teenager would be like growing up with 80s horrors because they were quite dark. If you, mm. if you imagine like a, a lot of things in society right now, especially, I suppose, with gaming, a lot of people would turn around and say a, a violent game will basically prompt someone to be violent. Yeah, they're kind of <laughs> archetypes of that yeah. sort of thinking. Exactly. Yeah, so no, because they've watched a lot of horror films, they've automatically thought, oh, well, I've got to be like this. Like, they I want to... Perfect plan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they kind of, in a, in a way, do fit that and um, do come up with almost a perfect plan. It's yeah. just that, you know, Sydney spoils it in the end. And it's interesting because obviously, you know, Wes Craven's... Um, meta looks on films are like we said before about um new nightmare there's that sort of like element of of have i done something wrong because you know when you make horror films you constantly have that that um opposition to it that's saying like this is morally unjust this is morally wrong yeah, yeah. and it does play on your mind sometimes and you think like is it like have I done something wrong? Like, I, I, and what is the ultimate conclusion of that thing going wrong? And that seems to maybe be the inspiration of those those sort of meta looks at the films. I think one of the things that Scream does brilliantly as well, especially with the first two at least, and um, yeah, the second one I suppose you could, um, but yeah, the the first one definitely is. It gives you all of the, like it introduces you to all these different characters who would effectively have their own motives, and it basically quite obviously tells you which one it is that's going to be the killer. But because then there's these other curveballs as well, you're constantly questioning, so it becomes really investigatory. I can't even say that. <coughs> it becomes like your own investigation as an audience member because mm. you're. I remember the first time I watched it, I was relatively young. And um, I think it came out in 96, didn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's not long after when it came out. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm like, oh, you know, who is it? Oh, it's going to be this guy. And you, you can then have a conversation with someone. It's like, who did you think it was? And did it. I don't know. I, I just love that element of it. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot more <clears throat> like that than, than um, a classic slashes. I think yeah. as it goes on, though, like the third one, it never really became like that because the well, killer more meta it just yeah, kept but going meta and meta and meta and meta the killer well in the second one it's point blank like obvious who it is it turns out to be the, the camera guy doesn't it and he's aligned with some woman who got killed is, by yes, Ghostface his mother yeah that was it and um, it's someone's mother someone <laughs> who got killed um, in the first one but yeah the third one kind of completely deviated from that and it turns out to be Sydney's brother or something Long lost brother. I think also one of the things about Scream in particular, we have to remember that although it is Wes Craven who directed, Kevin Williamson wrote it. And then he wrote a lot of meta horrors that followed after it. He wrote, um, I know he did last summer. But I was saying this to um, Jackson earlier in the week is that that whole kind of. Scream had such an effect on horror that meta horror pretty much immediately was in everything, you know? There was always that feel in all the films, urban legends, and just constantly pushing this new... It was like the audience, they clicked in with the audience. We're like, all right, the audience knows horror. So we all need to now know that we're in a horror film. And Scream was the one that really allowed that. And I think that's, that's quite a big thing to actually achieve, you know? And I think the reason why it achieved it so well outside of just the, the script itself is because you did have Wes Craven, a horror pioneer, one of the old guys, a veteran. He'd been around since the 70s. He'd already been 20 years into creating horror icons. So to bring that guy forwards for it, it legitimised the idea of, you know, meta horror being something that could be followed on. And you did just see a wave of other slashes. It was like the second wave of slashes. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting about Wes Craven. Is it like certain... Uh, particular films throughout his career seem to have like massively influenced entire genres and and you know had offshoots mm. from them and and I mean not every film uh, obviously there's there's been some bad ones in there but to have but, as like, many certain, it does. yeah certain yeah. pinnacle films that you know have uh, had such an impact but iconic characters as well like I think if you walked up to anyone in the street and you goes Freddy Krueger they would know who you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It might be insulted if they thought you were calling him Freddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got a big claw hand or something. Like, Burnt up face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anakin Skywalker. If, if we look at horror directors, yeah, it's very, very rare that they can have a success 
every decade they were alive. And Wes Craven achieved that. In the 70s, you know, his first film, Last House on the Left, might not have been a critical success. Initially. Yeah, it took time. And he's one of those classic horror directors that they just did not, they were not ready for that. It was too much of a conservative world we lived in. But that's why it's great that they did what they did. And to follow that in the 80s with Freddy, and then to come back with Scream, where you're looking at the thing that you already started with, I feel like there's a lot of respect to that, that pretty much every decade he was alive, he's, he released something that was important. And it's very rare for horror directors to be able to achieve that. And also, um, credit where credit's due, a majority of his work has also been revisited. Uh, remember when we were talking about Remix? Yeah. Um, like, a lot of his yeah. films have been remade um, over time, like The Last House on the Left. They're all terrible, though. The only good one is The, How the Hills Have Eyes. <laughs> the rest yeah. of them are awful. The Nightmare on Elm Street remake should not have happened yeah. the but way it was made. The, the What I'm saying is, is that you wouldn't take something that was terrible and do a remake on it. You're trying to take something that was iconic in its time. I don't know. I think I think that that's where they go wrong with these. That remakes. is where they, go they wrong treat with it. They, they try to remake the ones that are like you know the the big ones that are well known because it is a cash grab at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. It can it be for. perceived as that, but you but, you modernize it. Remember what we said at the the remake. Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. yeah but but I think not. I think you you take like I th I think you're better off taking one of the lesser you know. One of the films that isn't as well done but has a nice concept to it. Yeah. And like, yeah, remake that. With, with Wes Craven, though, to, to go back to Wes Craven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, he's, you're right, he's made classics, basically. He has made classics of the horror genre that will get remade for modern audiences. And every single one of them, people will still go, I prefer the original. And that's why he's a great horror auteur. And then his final film, Scream 4, 2011. Yeah, which is, I, I remember like, because I'm a nerd and I read a lot of film news since, well, I don't know, for a long time. I remember the buzz of when they were talking about making Scream 4. It was 11 years, I think, yeah. since Scream 3, wasn't it? And it was that time when reboots suddenly became a big thing on everyone's lips. And it was kind of like, well, are they going to reboot Scream? Because that's what the talk was for a long time. Oh, they're just going to change it from the beginning. But they didn't want to do that. And it's cool. Even in the fourth film, you've still got the same cast and crew. And I think with those films in particular, what Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson did so well, is they created this weird unity within the Scream films. That's why they're all back for the fifth one. Yeah. And they're all desperately like, we need to do this for Wes Craven. Like, they, they don't want to dishonor like what he'd already created with those four films. And it shows there must have been a real, yeah, like family unity within, yeah, what, what Scream was, you know? So to summarize guys, what would be your favorite Wes Craven film and why? Sam? Um, again, I think I, I'm going to know the answer to both your... For me, it's Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, I just think... I think it's because I just it's so vivid from being a teenager and having sleep paralysis and having all these very vivid nightmares and then having Freddy actually infiltrate the reality into my own dreams is terrifying. I think that sometimes the best horror movies are the most simplest concepts. He can get you in your dreams. That is ingenious. And again, as we discussed, having Nancy as the uh, final girl and having someone that you can you could relate to. Plus Johnny Depp's in it. You, you're a good final girl. No, but you know what I mean, though. <laughs> We've all been bullied. We've all yeah, felt yeah, like yeah. something that's out of our control and it's just mocking you. Because that's the other thing with Freddy. It's always mocking you. And all that turns Taunting, into comedy yeah. later on, in the first one, is terrifying. It's got so much iconic imagery that like, I've always desire to be able to do a Freddy film and it's because of the original it's not because of the ones that followed it Jack um, like you said you know what I'm going to say uh, I wanted to just change it up because, it just but I can't I completely can't, left um, field no I, I, it's New Nightmare because uh, for me what I love about it is that it it plays on that idea of, of what you create and how it can how it, like take on its own life and and come back and do some kind of damage to you in some way. Um, and, you know, the, the, the idea of acting as a character and sort of being taken over by that and starting mm. to become that role or, or you know, as, as is happening to, um, can't remember the actress's name, but Nancy. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, she becomes Nancy as the film goes on. And there's something just really, like, uh, terrifying about that to me is that your own creations can you know in that sort of uh, conceptual sense of like script writing and, and filmmaking um, you know that that can 
that can take some kind of power and and yeah uh, influence the world. So mine would be Scream. Yeah, like uh, <clears throat> I love a Nightmare on Elm Street, but it, it, I think whenever I watched it, I'd already seen Scream, and it just it wasn't a standout-ish to me. I remember initially seeing Ghost Fist and hearing it for the first time, and you have I didn't really understand at the time. You have this, but now I went looking back. You have this main actress in the form of Drew Barrymore, yeah. who all the marketing was done on. And they pushed her and then they completely subvert your expectation by killing her off within the first 10 minutes and you're like oh as a kid I didn't understand that but like whenever you first hear the phone call and it's like what's your favourite scary movie you know yeah. and stuff like that was just awesome and thereafter like for many Halloweens um, after I'd have to have the screen outfit <laughs> and I, I just absolutely and funnily enough I don't know if it was the material but I remember the mask smelling really cool as well so when you put it on it's just like oh <laughs> so that, that's just a weird memory I have as a kid I dressed up as Freddy once I think I was like 12 which is a weird time to dress up as a Freddy really considering his backstory you know fair <laughs> enough yeah alright and on that note, <laughs> um, guys, we hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. And uh, as ever, please leave a like, leave a comment, let us know your favourite um, Wes Craven film. And uh, please subscribe. Check out our website as well. We've got new stuff going up there soon. www.trasharts.co.uk And uh, other than that, guys, Trash Arts take out. Bye. Bye.